looks upon our hearts, and it's what God knows us through and through. And there's a verse in Proverbs that says, uh, He who covereth his sins shall not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. That's the normal lifestyle of the Christian. We all sin, but we confess and we forsake them. The hypocrite does neither. He doesn't doesn't confess his sins, and uh, he, he doesn't receive God's mercy. And that's what's talked about here in this verse is the fact that God looks upon the hearts, and he, he hates it when there's that disparity between what we do on the outside and what we are on the inside. There should be consistency in the life of the believer. And um, so we all sin, but we should confess our sins and uh, forsake them. And that the hypocrite doesn't do such things. So let's, uh, actually, I remember too that uh, God, res- the Lord Jesus reserves some of his harshest criticism for uh, the hypocrites, the people that uh, pretended to be something that they weren't just so that uh, they would have the approval of men. But God looks upon the heart. Let's read it together. Therefore, the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, for their fear of me is taught by commandment of men. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. I'm not sure if you know this song or not, but Peggy and I are going to sing it through uh, once without uh, the instruments, and then we'd like you to join us and sing it through twice. Now, the singing that happens in the church is to be unlike singing that happens anywhere else in the world because it's to come from our hearts, but it's to be directed to the Lord. From our hearts to the Lord is what it says in Ephesians and Colossians. And, and so many times, you know, we sing about the Christian faith, we sing about the Lord, but we, we fail sometimes perhaps to sing to the Lord. And one thing that I have appreciated about some of the newer choruses, and when I say newer, I'm talking about the ones that came out in the 70s, you know, <laughs> uh, brand new choruses, was that they were directed to the Lord, you know, and that's the case with this song. So Peg and I will sing it through once, and then we'll have you join us. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Sing that with us. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Now you know it. Let's stand and sing it one more time. 
like to have you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, a couple of verses in the end of 14, and then we'll jump into chapter 15. We've been studying and learning lessons from the parables and the analogies that uh, Jesus gave as we find them recorded in Matthew's gospel. Jesus was the master teacher. I mean, he was the teacher par excellence. And um, uh, he had such wonderful ways of connecting um, his, his message to the hearts of people by way of things that they were uh, more familiar with. This morning we come to three minor parables that are tucked in a passage where Jesus exposed the emptiness of hypocritical religion and heartless worship. And so let's get right into it. At uh, chapter 14 and verse 34, we see his uh, compassion for the crowd. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched, it were made perfectly well. Well, the reputation of the Lord Jesus had spread and uh, they, they knew that he was a healer. And notice all who came or were brought to Jesus who, or, or who merely touched the hem of his garment were made perfectly well. The crowd came begging for help and Jesus turned nobody away. He healed people whether they had faith or not. And once again, Jesus shows us what God is like. He didn't just say, God loves you, be well, have a nice day. No, he didn't do that. He healed people to demonstrate how much God cares for them with a love that is, listen, active, an active kind of love. But with this revelation of God's heart, there's, there's pathos in this scene because we know from other passages that most in this crowd came only for what Jesus could do for them. When Jesus offered himself and called for commitment, the crowd here and everywhere tended to thin out. As John 6:66 6, says, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. You know, the fact is, like these people, we often remember God only when we're desperate. Only when we need him. But these people here saw Jesus as the compassionate healer who came to bring life to a sick and dying race. He gave the sick what they sought, but what they sought was far less than the spiritual healing that Jesus wanted to give them. And so before we hear what Jesus says about heartless worship, it's important for us to recognize the heart of God the God who really does love us. Now, secondly, we see his confrontation with the religious in chapter 15, 1 to 9. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the, the uh, tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now the scribes and the Pharisees often appeared together because they, they shared a passion for God's law and the volumes of traditions that they had added to God's law. The common people held these religious men high in high esteem, but Jesus called them hypocrites. They were play actors. They were trick-or-treaters in costume. And notice they came to Jesus from Jerusalem. They came all the way around the lake to get to Jesus. And they may have been an official delegation that was dispatched to question Jesus in order to find reasons to discredit him. 
See, they were convinced that he wasn't the Messiah, but he was an imposter. And so they were determined to find a way to eliminate him. But instead of incriminating Jesus, their question provides some real insight into what religious legalism is, how a legalist thinks, and what a legalist does. In verse 2, the question they came all the way from Jerusalem to ask him was this, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? Now, since the rabbis were responsible for their disciples' behavior, much like head coaches who are responsible for the behavior of their players, they hoped to pin this violation on Jesus. And for the benefit of his Gentile readers, Mark explained the washing ceremonies that were familiar and were required of every Jew. Mark 7, 3 and 4. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches. Would you notice? By their own ambition, the Pharisees said hand washing was a tradition a tradition that was established by Israel's elders. Now, the law of God, the Levitical law, required priests to wash before engaging in their priestly duties. Yet this law that God had given had nothing to do with hygiene, but it symbolized the spiritual cleansing needed to approach God. But God's law required no such thing of the average person who was about to eat a meal. The tradition the disciples were accused of violating was instituted by Israel's elders. And, and you know, I think to myself, they must have reasoned this way. If hand-washing is good for the priests, if hand-washing is pleasing to God, it must be good for everybody. If washing our hands is the way of holiness, we need to define exactly how it's to be done. And, and listen, while we're, while we're at it, let's wash our hands when we return from the market, whenever we've been in the presence of Gentiles, in between courses of a meal, and when we're finished eating. You see what their reasoning was? Their reasoning was this, more is better. More is better when it comes to law. And this reasoning resulted in hundreds and hundreds of minute uh, traditions. I tried to bake brownies one time. I read what it said on the box. It said that that I needed to to put an egg in and mix the batter, right? Well, I thought if one egg's good, two ought to be great, right? So I put two eggs in. You know what I made? Patio blocks. That's that's what the brownies were. They were they were patio blocks. And when I got one out of the, uh, it was one big brownie that I got out of the pan. It was a patio block. Yeah. Well, this was their their thinking. More is better. Now, uh, another example is the law of fasting, and the law required Jews to fast only twice a year, twice a year. But by the time Jesus came, the Pharisees fasted twice a week. That's 51 times more than God's law required. The ceremonial traditions they devised and imposed went far beyond God's requirements. They became so tedious, so burdensome, that they actually upstaged the moral laws that God had given. They were deemed more important than his moral laws. They advanced a superficial and heartless form of worship that could be mechanically practiced without any faith and without any true love for God. And these traditions were not written in the Torah, but they were passed along orally, and eventually they were codified and engraved in the Jewish handbooks known as the Talmud and the Mishnah. Now, this hand-washing tradition was typical of hundreds of other rules they added to God's law, and it was a rule that was, was open. In other words, it could be witnessed and it could be monitored. So, so this is what legalism is. This is what the legalist sincerely believes God requires, and this is what the legalist does. Now, I did a little research, and when I looked into instructions for hand washing, and these still exist today, 
I found discrepancies in each presentation. For example, one presentation insists that the cup, the cup that has the rinsing water in it, must have two handles. I don't know why, but not just one handle, it has to have two. For example, one presentation insists the cup, uh, the water must be poured over the hands twice, and in still another, the water is to be poured over the hands three times. There again, more is better, right? In one presentation, care is urged not to allow the water to run up the unwashed part of the arm and then down again. And why is that? Because the water that touches the unwashed part of the arm is unclean, and if it runs down the arm, it defiles any part of the arm or the hand that it touches. Consequently, the whole process has to be repeated. And then, too, if the person washing their hands happens to speak between the prescribed prayer that follows the washing and the prescribed prayer of thanksgiving that's offered before the meal, the whole washing process has to be repeated. You do this at home, don't you? I mean, every time you have a meal, you gather the kids around the sink, and this is what you do? Now, the Jews believed that in order to be righteous or in right standing with God, all of this had to be done before eating a ham and Swiss on rye. Now, forgive me, I forgot. Ham is not on the Jewish menu. Yeah. But this is how it is with legalism. The rules are often specific, well-defined, and minute, and yet subject to a variety of interpretations. And remember, this rinsing ceremony was entirely symbolic. The cold water poured over the hands in a ceremonial way was like a placebo that is powerless to cleanse anybody from sin's defilement. The Catholics have seven sacraments. Seven sacraments. All are necessary for entrance into heaven. And yet, what are they? They're traditions. They're not biblical. They're traditions. If you study the Amish you'll find great disparity in the interpretation of their rules of holiness. Some have no curtains in their homes because they feel curtains are luxury items. Others have curtains. Some don't use tractors but rely on pure horsepower. Others use tractors for farming as long as they don't have pneumatic tires. That's the case in Mayo, the group that's in Mayo. Under, uh, or like Judaism, under the Pharisees, every religion requires some kind of works that emphasize external matters of no, no eternal consequence. Religion, listen to what it is. It's man on the honor system. Let me explain. God deserves the honor, but man thinks he can design the systems. So at this time, the leaders of Israel were ignoring the prophecies fulfilled by the arrival of Jesus. They paid no attention to the miracles he performed. They were tone deaf to the unique authority of his teaching. And on a coming day, they would even discount his resurrection. You see, their minds and hearts were made up concerning him. He must not be the Messiah. He must not. How do we know? How can we be sure? Because his disciples don't respect their man-made traditions. And this was how far Judaism had strayed from God's desire to be loved and worshipped in spirit and truth. Jesus preached the same message that was thundered by the prophets before him. In Isaiah chapter 1, the Lord spoke through Isaiah and said he hated, listen, he hated Israel's heartless ceremonies. And yet Israel refused to hear the prophets and would refuse to hear Jesus, the greatest prophet of all. They preferred their system of rituals and traditions. And listen to this. According to some rabbinical writings, they actually expected God to submit to their traditions. Is that the height of brazenness? God, you have to do all these things that we think we should do. You have to do it. Mincing no words in Matthew 23, 24, Jesus said, blind guides who strain at, out a net and swallow a camel. camel. 
You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. In other words, they insisted on trivia while giving li little or no attention to the serious matters of the law. Matters like God's command to show mercy, God's command to practice love, God's command to extend forgiveness. So these men came all the way from Jerusalem, not to ask how to administer justice with equity, not to ask how to reach the unbelieving in Israel and the surrounding nations, not to ask how to better care for those suffering from disease, aging, or poverty. They came accusing Jesus because his disciples didn't wash their hands before eating. And while accusing his disciples, they were plotting to murder Jesus. Unwashed hands were unacceptable, but hatred and conspiring to murder was acceptable. <laughs> evil had become good, and good had become evil. Now notice how Jesus responded in verse 3. He turned the tables on these men. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Now, they accused the disciples of breaking a man-made tradition. That was okay, not okay. But at the same time, Jesus knew that they were violating a command that God had given, yet they felt okay about that. The command God had given says, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. But the Jews found a loophole, a clever way to circumvent this command of God. And the detail of their violation is in verse 4 and 5. According to a tradition, they made up some of, or, or all of their wealth could be dedicated to God and off limits for other uses. Uh, Mark 7 and verse 11, but you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is korban, that is a gift devoted to to God. So when a parent asked for financial help, their tradition allowed them to dishonor their parents by giving them nothing. Nothing. They would simply say their discretionary funds were korban, that is, they were earmarked as a gift to God. I can't give it to you. And since those who practiced this tradition were selfish, selfish and greedy, korban funds almost never made it to the offering plate. By this technicality, Jesus said, Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. In other words, their man-made traditions had actually superseded and negated God's command. And it's no wonder that in verse 7 to 9, Jesus rebuked these Pharisees and scribes as hypocrites, as play actors. Well, Jesus then quoted the rebuke of Isaiah 29, 1 to 3, which condemned the nation for practices like these. He said, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You know, like Isaiah centuries earlier, Jesus exposed the Lord's deepest concern. Israel suffered heart disease. <laughs> they didn't love God. They didn't love God. They honored him with their lips only. With hearts defiled by sin and disengaged from fellowship with God, they sang their psalms of praise. But their worship, their religion, their approach to God was worse than worthless. It was empty, it was hollow, and it was actually offensive to God. And like so much religion today, their worship was artificial and it was godless. God wasn't in it. Their rituals and traditions were unacceptable to the God who must be approached on his terms, not, not on terms we devise. You know, every religion except Christianity can be described as a man-devised way to approach God. But since God cannot be approached by our best ideas, our best efforts, our best rules, he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus. And his word tells us that the only way to come to him, the only way to be right with him, is through the righteous covering his blood provides. See, Jesus kept for us the law that we could not possibly keep. 
and that he died under the penalty of that law that he never broke. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 diagnoses the human condition in these terms, but we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. See, every human being needs the cleansing and the righteousness that comes as a gift to those who trust, not what they can do, but what Christ has done for us. No one will ever come to God by the way of the righteousness he attempts to gain by his traditions or his efforts. Well, now at last we come to the first of the three minor parables in these verses. And, and what we find is Jesus offering a clarification to the crowd. Verse 10 and 11. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Now because the crowd overheard the previous conversation, Jesus wanted them to understand his response. The crowd, listen, and the whole world must come to terms with the emptiness of man-made religion. And in three short commands, Paul summarized this system of rules made up by man that holds millions of people in bondage. You know what the, the, the uh, system insists? It insists there are things we must not handle, there's things we must not taste, there are things we much, must not touch. Can I tell you this? Christianity... Christianity has sometimes been defined by terms like these. Instead of being known for positive qualities of love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control, we're sometimes identified by the things we don't do. We don't do. Now, some behaviors are clearly out of bounds for God's people, some behaviors are clearly forbidden by God's law, his moral law. But well-intentioned believers have often exchanged our freedom in Christ for bondage to lists of things God's word says nothing about. Galatians 5 and verse 1 warns us to guard against the temptation to return to legalism. Stand, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. But in the church, and throughout history of the church, certain rules are, or standards are sometimes taught and required of others and made as binding as God's law. And what begins as a preference or a personal conviction often morphs into a standard that we expect everybody to accept and submit to. To make matters worse, judgment is often passed on those who don't adhere to these man-made standards. You know, I'm old enough to remember that shooting pool or riding a motorcycle was once felt to be ungodly, and they were things Christians ought not ever do. I talked to Sam, and he said he loved to play pool. And he also rides a moped. That makes Sam one of the worst sinners in our church. <laughs> yeah, there's no hope for Sam. No, he's got that 50cc moped <laughs> that makes 35 miles an hour. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, it has wickedness written all over it. Traditional playing cards, attendance at movie theaters were also believed to be sinful and unchristian. Now, you may disagree with any of these. That's fine. But to prevent defilement, these evangelical taboos were not so different from the traditions the Pharisees established. And because some associated shooting pool and riding motorcycles with a wild and reckless lifestyle, fences were erected. Oh, man, we've got to keep these things out of bounds. Don't touch them. Don't touch them. And then old Chuck Swindoll came riding in on his big Harley Davidson. And we had to rethink our taboo. 
I'll tell you about that Chuck Swindoll guy. He was commenting about women wearing makeup because some believe women shouldn't wear makeup, they shouldn't wear jewelry. And, and here's what Swindoll said. He said, if the barn needs painting, paint it. <laughs> that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. The barn needs paint, paint it. But we laugh, but there was a time when Christians were dead serious about the evil of playing cards in attendance at, at the movies, about jewelry, about makeup. I, I've seen people do a 180-degree turn at the door of the church I pastored because when they looked inside, they saw a Christmas tree. Oh, that can't be. We can't have that. It's God words. God's words say that we can't have a Christmas tree? See, the point is this. Though 20 centuries removed, we're not exempt from this temptation to major on minors and things that are external. And the church can be as guilty as the Pharisees were when we add taboos to God's law. I mean, I've known some guys who dress up on Sunday. They dress to kill, but outside the church, they're abusive. They're entertained by pornography. They cheat their employer. And they have no positive witness for Christ whatsoever. Just like hand washing, rules that focus on things that are external and superficial often mask and obscure the sins that really defile a man or a woman. And what did Jesus say this is? This is hypocrisy. This is play acting. So Jesus set things straight in verse 10 and 11 with respect to eating with unwashed hands. He said, it isn't what goes into a man's mouth that makes him unclean, but what comes out. And this is the, the first parable of the, free, uh, of the three. If it needs a title, we might label it the in and out parable. And by unclean, Jesus was talking about moral defilement that separates people from God and invites his condemnation. Behavior that makes people unclean doesn't come from the outside. It doesn't come from things we handle, touch, or taste. What defiles a person originates deep inside their being. Now, now hold that thought because Jesus comes back to it because he needs to explain it further in verse 17 to 20. But first, verse 12, his correction for the disciples. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. And then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters into the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Now, now, Jesus seems to be a distance from the crowd, and he's speaking now to his disciples in a more private setting. And you remember the common people respected and admired the Pharisees outwardly. They seemed to be the holiest men in town, but Jesus didn't share that opinion. In fact, as, as Steve said, his strongest words of condemnation were, were reserved for Israel's leaders because they were hypocrites whose teachings led so many astray. And Jesus called them hypocrites that were like whitewashed tombs and cups cleaned only on the outside. In other words, they were all about appearance, but rotten and filthy inwardly. But here the disciples seemed concerned that Jesus had offended these so-called holy men. They felt it wasn't wise to rock the boat by irritating them. And yet at this point in their training, Jesus knew that it was imperative for his disciples to recognize who and what these false teachers really were. Maybe you remember uh, in his 2002 State of the Union address when President George Bush dared to use the phrase axis of evil. You remember that? axis of evil. The whole nation gasped in horror when he said it. Isn't 
politically correct to make such judgments in a world where everything is cast in shades of gray. And yet, just as the United States needed to hear who and what we were up against in the Gulf War, and just as it's imperative for believers to call sin, sin, it was imperative for Jesus to draw a line in the sand. And so here comes the second parable that could be labeled uprooted plants. Now, in the Psalms, God's people are, are called the plantings of the Lord. But on the other side, there exists an axis of evil, a class of people that God has not planted. People who have instead been planted by the adversary like weeds among the wheat. And one day, every false teacher, every unrepentant sinner will be exposed and will be uprooted. And though they appear settled in and here to stay, God will uproot them. In a world where Shades of gray are preferred. God has drawn lines and God has made clear distinctions. Inclusivism without borders is inconsistent with his holiness and his purity. And so, you know, this morning, each of us has come to God one of two ways. We've come our way or we've come his way. Our way or his way. There's no third option. We have, have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, as God has commanded us to do, or we have rejected him. There's no neutrality. There's no middle ground. And so here Jesus made it clear that these men, so many looked up to, were not from God. And you should just leave them alone. Leave them alone like the weeds among the wheat. A day is coming when God will make the separation. And what made them so evil was their hypocrisy combined with the extent of their influence. Then at last we come to the third and final parable, blind guides. These minor parables are, are really easy to understand, especially this one. Can you imagine the futility of one blind person trying to lead another blind person? I mean, wouldn't it be hilarious to blindfold Dion? and uh, to ask him to leave Steed, who, Steve, who is also blindfolded, down the aisle, up the steps, and into the church office. Wouldn't it be fun just to watch? Steve, can you do it? De Dion, can you do it? You know. Yeah. See, because neither party could see, together they leave the right way and they fall into a pit. Remember when Jesus saw the multitudes, he had compassion on, passion on them? And why was that? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? He leads his flock. And so this was the situation. They professed to be the shepherds of Israel, but they weren't. They were blind. In verse 15, Peter asks for further clarification. He said, explain this parable to us. And the answer Jesus gave refers back to the in and the out parable of verse 11. Though Jesus expected the disciples to understand this, he enlarged on his previous statement. In 17, he says, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. And so here, Jesus directly refutes the false religious notions of the Pharisees. And he insists that defilement doesn't come from things like food or drink that are outside of a person's body. What enters from the outside passes through the digestive system is eventually eliminated. It enters the stomach without ever touching a person's heart. Doesn't have that ability. And this is a broad teaching that encompasses all sorts of external things for which handle not, touch not, and taste not are rules that are invented by religious people. Nothing we can handle, touch, taste, or ride, in Sam's case, can save us, make us holy, or cause us to love God. Have we picked on you enough sufficiently this morning? <laughs> 
That's good. That's good. Yeah. I got permission to bust on him this morning. So. In the same way, none of these external things can defile us. What comes out of the mouth represents the sin that originates in our hearts. That's where sin originates, you know. It comes from our heart. And I'm sure you know this already, but there's a direct link between our heart and our tongue. A direct link. What, what we're thinking in our heart, our attitudes, bitterness, resentment, whatever it may be, anger, eventually comes out of our mouth in words that we speak. My family really believed this. I grew up in a, in a Christian home, and I was the oldest of eight children. And whenever somebody, usually around the table, would say something unkind uh, or something that you know, maybe wasn't, wasn't appropriate, somebody, somebody would say, your heart is showing. Your heart is showing. And that's biblical. I mean, that is right on. That's what Jesus was saying. And so he then lists some sins his followers must have nothing to do with. And see the list again? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the unclean impulses that originate in the deepest region of who we are. And like a spiritual EKG, the presence of these reveals the actual, the actual condition of our hearts before God. Where, where these exist, God doesn't. Where these are tolerated, God is excluded. These inner sins can be covered with cosmetics, covered with nice clothing, but they can't be hidden from God. You know, in our church in Ohio, this is going back a lot of years, I mean, 1978 to 83. We had a, a lady we had led to Christ who had, had offered to help with our children's program. And Louise was sincerely trying to give up a smoking habit, but she still struggled with this habit because she'd had it for many years, many years. Our church had a Christian education banquet at a local restaurant, and Louise was invited to attend, and during a, a break after dinner, she lit up a cigarette in the ladies' washroom. Well, later that evening, another woman from our church came to me with anger and disapproval written all over her face, and she said, Pastor Dean, I can't believe, I just can't believe we have someone who smokes working with our children and serving in our church. I can't believe. Well, I listened quietly and wondered if she thought this called for a public flogging or perhaps tar and feathers. <laughs> uh, but here's what I knew. Here's what I knew. This woman who was so upset by a lighted cigarette knew everybody's business and was notorious for a gossiping tongue. I was careful not to throw that in her face. Funny, isn't it? Verse 19 doesn't mention smoking, but it does list false witness and blasphemies or slander. Yet which of these is the greater sin in the minds of many Christians, and which one is more offensive to God? So answering the charge made by the Pharisees and the legal experts, Jesus said, these are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Jesus was concerned that his people come to terms with his principle. To live in true righteousness, we must have transformed hearts. Rules, ceremonies, man-made traditions can never correct the congenital heart disease we were born with. We were born with. The only way to be transformed in our hearts is to surrender to him as Savior and Lord. Religion can never transform the hearts of sinful people like us. And yes, this transformation is the miracle the Old Testament anticipated and Jesus made possible. Here it is, Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And you know, this is precisely what Jesus offers everybody who comes to him in simple faith, he offers to give us a new heart. This is the inner healing 
that he longed to give the crowds that were gathered in the region of Gennesaret. I'll fix that withered leg. I'll heal you of that blindness. I'll restore your hearing, but what you need is you need a new heart. You need a new heart. Let me just wrap this up with a simple reminder. God wants your heart. He wants your heart more than anything else. Jesus told a young lawyer, the greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And so the question I ask myself, the question I ask you is, is, is do we love the Lord? I mean, do we really love him? Do we really love him? Is, is our heart engaged and focused on him when we come to worship and then every day thereafter? It's so easy for our minds to drift off to afternoon activities, something we don't like that was said, sung, or done, or to become distracted by some trivial thing that won't matter a hoot in eternity. It's so easy for that to happen. In that same church that I pastored in the uh, Cleveland area, there was a couple, Mel and Bessie Granning. They're, they're with the Lord now. I hope they're with the Lord. We had windows all the way around our worship center, and we had a U driveway parking in the back. And so this is a fact. When Mel and Bessie, when their parking spot was occupied, they didn't stay for church that day. And so here comes Mel and Bessie. They paused in the parking area. Oh, there they go. Not today. Not today. Their parking spot is taken by somebody else. That's true. That's true. Hmm. Do you really love the Lord? <laughs> Do you really love the Lord? Charles Spurgeon once asked his congregation a very heart-searching question. I thought I had it here. If there were no Sunday morning services at 11, how many of you would be Christians? Hmm. See, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Every Sunday morning, worship can become something mechanical and heartless, or it can be something that is very precious and intimate, relational, as we come to worship the Lord. As we see in this passage, legalism has a sinister way of creeping in. You know, it promotes pride and fosters false security while obscuring the things that matter the most to God. And what matters the most is that we love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Let's pray together. Father, we again are humbled at your word. We're humbled at the thought that Jesus could continue to teach us today by means of his spirit and his word. And how directly his words penetrate our being expose the facade of religiosity that we so often take on, wanting to be thought well of, wanting to appear Christian, when in fact our hearts are disconnected and far from you. And so I pray, Father, that you would help us to see what really matters the most in your sight. We want to love you with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, and with all of our mind, because you are worthy of nothing less. And so help us, help us to be sincere through and through. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Sam, ride your motorcycle up here and sing for us. Help us sing, will you? Our next hymn was written by a lady. Her name was Elizabeth Prentice. And I would say that this hymn stands the test of time. She was born in 1818. And just a little bit about her, like so many hymns, More Love to Thee was inspired at a time of personal tragedy. It was composed by Elizabeth, who with her husband lost a child, and shortly thereafter a second child. Through her grief, she confided in her di diary, Empty Hands, 
a worn out, exhausted body, and unutterable longings to flee from a world that has so many sharp experiences. Yet despite her grief, Elizabeth didn't become embittered, but desired to love the Lord more. May that be our heart's desire. More love to between the verses of that hymn. Hey, we want to pray for the meal that we're going to enjoy. And there's so much food down there, we don't mind if you stuff some in your purse and take it home with you. But we got a bunch down there, and we got to, got to make sure it's gone. Now, what happens Tuesday? This is a consequential election. 